We'll go ahead and begin. Welcome you all. This is wonderful to see you. Thank you for being here. We want to welcome you to the 48th Annual Distinguished Graduate Faculty Lecture at Auburn University. I look across this room and I see some of previous faculty lecture honorees, emeritus faculty, and many of our College of Education faculty, as well as students. I thank you all for being here today as we honor and celebrate the scholarly contributions of Dr. Nancy Berry. I am Maria Witte. I'm the Associate Dean out of the Graduate School. Dr. George Flowers, the Dean, will be joining us a little bit later, but uh, we all want to welcome you. The Distinguished Graduate Faculty Lecture began in 1975 to 76 academic year and is jointly sponsored by the Graduate School and the Auburn Alumni Association. Since its inception, this lecture has developed into a much anticipated annual event that fosters a better understanding of the scholarly contributions made by Auburn's faculty. Nominations for this honor are solicited from the university's faculty and the recipient is selected by a committee of graduate faculty members. The lecturer receives a monetary award from the Auburn Alumni Association and is recognized at Auburn University's annual faculty award ceremony. I'd like to now recognize Dr. Paul Fitchett, who is the department head of curriculum and teaching in the College of Education. He will be able to introduce our distinguished graduate faculty lecture for this year. Thank you, Associate Dean Witte. And let me reiterate my thanks for attending today. Dr. Nancy Berry joined the University, Auburn University faculty in 1990 as an assistant professor after teaching in both public and private schools and completing her PhD in music education at Florida State University. In 2000, Dr. Berry left Auburn for a few years to join the faculty of the University of Oklahoma. After several years, she returned to Auburn as Department Head of Curriculum and Teaching in the College of Education in 2007, where she has served in the role for four years. She has over 25 years of experience at Auburn alone. Think about that, everyone, 25 years, that's a lot, that's amazing. You can read in your program today how well published and honored she is through her academic career and professional service. But what I want to tell you today is how well loved she is among her students and how committed she is to preparing them for their careers in music education. Let me read a quote from Niall Wilson, Music Education Class of 2022. While Dr. Berry always expected us to do our best work, she helped people who struggled. She gave us challenging projects and offered us honest feedback that helped us improve our work. She had high standards, but was warm and caring. She always wanted her students to succeed. I will never forget a compliment she gave me that came at the right moment. During my first two weeks of class, I had doubts about handling doctoral work. During my first consultation with her, she said she thought of me as a scholarly person and, 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 that, and that I shared important insights during class. After excelling in Dr. Barry's class, I felt so proud to be an Auburn student. Dr. Barry represents what is best about the College of Education and the Department of Curriculum and Teaching a commitment to graduate teaching excellence. And without further ado, I introduced our distinguished faculty lecturer, Dr. Nancy Berry. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Whitty. Thank you, Dr. Fitchett. And again, very, very humbling to have this honor. And certainly, uh, I owe so much gratitude to my administrators, uh, 
Dr. Flowers isn't here, but he, he always teaches my doctoral students to see the light. <laughs> you can tell him I said that. Uh, my colleagues, my administrators, and my beautiful students. Uh, I mean, honestly, I learn, I always say I learn with and from my students and they teach me so much every, every time, every class. So thank you so much. Let's see, put my timer on. We professors have been known to talk a bit. Okay, so uh, we go. Okay, so uh, 21st century learners, what are they like? What are their characteristics? So let's look at a couple of examples. Some of you may remember seeing, there was a lot of media about this. Oh my goodness, typical college student has a shorter attention span than a goldfish. So, and okay, quiz for you. Is this true or false? True or false, what do you think? Actually, it's a little bogus. There, there is definitely peer-reviewed scholarly research that does indicate that um, based on some types of measures, attention spans are shorter. We'll get into that more a little bit later, but the reason is that now with the media, we're so distracted and we're multitasking all the time that people are learning to focus less closely on any one task because you're multitasking constantly. Uh, I actually spent quite a bit of time trying to track down the original article. And the best I could find is, and I'm not sure it was peer reviewed, but there was a report out of Microsoft, one of their think tanks, had an end of, of about 210. And somehow this hit the media. And it's like, oh, this is so cool. So all of a sudden all over the place is, well, your typical college student has a shorter attention span than a goldfish. Well, uh, it reminds me as a music educator. Um, anybody here been around long enough to remember the Mozart effect? The whole idea that listening to Mozart, and, and this was a very similar situation, a relatively small study, small and very short-term limited of measurable effect carried out by Roche, who at the time was a graduate student under Howard Gardner at Project Zero at Harvard. Um, and she's currently still on that staff. Uh, but reminds me of the Mozart effect because I don't know, the media picked it up, thought it was cool, thought it was exciting. All of a sudden, everybody, the, the buzz is out there. So um, there is valid scientific empirical research that does show according to certain measures that uh, the ability of uh, an individual today, typical individual today to focus on a particular task, uh, attention span is much shorter than it used to be. But the whole goldfish thing and all of that, that's a little, again, it's kind of like the Mozart effect. You do know that um, the governor of Georgia, I think it was Miller at the time, actually allocated state funds to make sure that every child born in Georgia got a Mozart CD. So Georgia could be the smartest state in the union. So anyhow, kind of like the boats are okay, Next slide. Okay, here's a quotation. The children now, and basically the whole idea is today's learners are selfish, rude, and disrespectful. So, okay. And this is attributed to Socrates. Uh, and uh, I mean, the reality is, since probably the beginning of time, the older generation has been concerned about the younger generation. The younger generation thought the older generation was out of touch and didn't know what was going on. So, th so th this is not new. And, thanks Libby. Okay, okay. and um, true or false? Now, now, actually, uh, according to all the sources I could find, this is a very liberal paraphrase uh, of Socrates. It's attributed to Socrates, but again, it's not really a direct translated quotation. So, so there's a lot of myth, a lot of you know, kind of fake science out there. Let's take a look at what some more empirical peer-reviewed research has to say. So, um, so what are characteristics of 21st century learners? Okay, certainly these 21st century learners are technology natives. 
it, it's not unusual for me to see a family with a little infant baby in a stroller. And guess what? That little sweeties got that device. So, um, so that's the reality. Very familiar with technology. That's basically a primary means of communication, being in touch. Something that as a teacher, I had to become aware of is that technology, uh, familiarity with social media and popular technology does not necessarily lead us to assume, I see some teachers nodding out there. We can't assume that that means that our students are familiar with educational technology. So again, it's important not to assume that they understand the technology that we in our courses might expect them to be able to use for teaching and instruction. Uh, frequent use of technology can alter neural pathways. And there's quite a bit of research that's supporting that. Uh, and, and again, that could be a good thing or a bad thing. Technology is not inherently evil. It's just a matter of like any, any really, really powerful tool. And we won't even talk about um, artificial intelligence and you know writing your clicking to have your term papers ripped. I saw an announcement on the news about that this morning. And, Already, I think universities are trying to ban some of those apps, but I'm not sure how you can prevent students from using them on their own computers. But anyhow, that's a whole other talk. So uh, multitasking, dual task uh, conditions, like I've talked about before, that's kind of part of like the attention span research because people are multitasking. And uh, I mean, right now I've got my timer and I'm using the PowerPoint, I'm using the using technology a lot right now, but because we're multitasking, we're distracted. And for that reason, that tends to lead to more habit learning as opposed to declarative memory, critical thinking, and flexible learning. Uh, virtual learning environments can enhance students' perception of the importance of learning-oriented outcomes, while so social media use has an opposite effect. So uh, again, be aware of how you're using technology within the context of your teaching. If you're a professor, if you're an instructor, be aware that social media can be very effective in certain ways and in other ways can maybe not be the best way to promote student learning. Um, there's a shift from reading as literacy uh, to media as literacy. And there are uh, peer reviewed studies that are showing that people's ability to read critically, to read for content and detail, that that's going down. On the other side, there's also peer reviewed research that shows that there are gaming applications and um, applications of technology that can increase reading ability. So again, it, it's not that technology is inherently evil, but it's powerful. And as teachers, as professors, we have to understand how to harness that to maybe compensate for some of the negative aspects of technology use and harness that power in positive ways for our teaching, for our classroom. Uh, let's see. And then there is uh, quite a bit of research that's showing that there, uh, be because of technology use, there is a challenge with critically analyzing information and discriminating between what is valid and what is not. Google is now a verb. I'll Google that. Uh, I Googled the um, attention span of a fish and a lot of information came up. And an issue that we're seeing among 21st century learners, among our current crop of students, is if they Google it, it comes up. They accept that as, as truth, as valid, and aren't necessarily thinking critically about evaluating the source. Is it peer reviewed? And that's something that as teachers, we can be aware of, something that we can think about and use to help them think critically. Just because you Google it, it comes up. Just because it's on the internet, it's not truth. It may not be valid. Um, a lot of fake news out there. The goldfish thing, the Mozart effect, th those stemmed from actual studies, but it got so blown out of proportion, they became fake news. So again, just teaching our students to be more critical reviewers and consumers of this vast amount of information that surrounds us out there. Uh, certainly one of the, uh, I think, wonderful opportunities 
of our 21st century learners is we have an increasingly diverse population of students coming at us, richly diverse. And they, they bring a wealth of information about their own backgrounds, their own communities, their own heritage. So between fall 2000 and 2017, the percentage of public school students who were white decreased from, decreased from 61 to 48%, and the uh, percentage of students who were black decreased from 17 to 15%. In contrast, the percentage of students who were Hispanic increased from 16 to 27%. So we're seeing some very profound shifts in demographics in terms of the enrollment in our schools. Unfortunately, at this point, when you look at public school teachers and even college faculty, uh, the proportions are almost inverse to the proportions. What, what our students look like, their backgrounds is almost opposite of the teaching force. And when you don't have someone who looks like you, who comes from your same background, who's your teacher, who's your role model, that can be more challenging. So an important issue. Okay, next. And just a, a quick, this is from uh, the National Center for Education Statistics. And I cited them, I hope I'm not doing anything terrible by copying their chart since I'm citing them. I wouldn't publish it without their permission. But this is just a chart that shows shifts in demographics predict, uh, predicted up through fall 2029. And I think something important to consider about um, recruiting teachers, university faculty, and how we can help to balance so that our teaching faculty mirror more closely the demographics of our actual population. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, good news, college and universities are placing a long overdue higher priority on recruiting a more diverse student population. That's a good thing. Uh, and research data and statistics are showing a, 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 a gradual shift toward more diverse demographics in college student enrollment. So that may indicate that uh, some of these attempts at overcoming the systemic biases are actually being successful because we are seeing some shifts in those demographics. However, Recruiting students is only begin the beginning. Without active mentoring and other supports, students from diverse backgrounds may struggle with many issues as they attempt to navigate the perhaps unfamiliar culture of their college or university. Uh, and I'm currently, and I won't go into that that much today, uh, I'm a first generation college student. My father dropped out of high school and joined the, joined the army when he was 17. My mom um, didn't finish college. So I'm, I'm a first generation college student. I'm currently carrying out fascinating research, interviewing first generation music graduates to find out what were your challenges? What were your supports? How did you get through this? And it's really fascinating to hear their stories and find out you know, what were your challenges? How did you succeed? Uh, so that's, that's enough for another topic. So, but um, it's really important not just to recruit diverse students, but to mentor them and support them once they're here. And we're still seeing st some statistics that show that among non-traditional students, diverse students, there tend to be some higher dropout rates and some issues. So good news that the demographics uh, long overdue are slowly shifting toward more diversity and university enrollment. But once we get those students here, what are we doing to keep them here? and help them thrive and feel welcome and feel valued and feel like they are an important part of the university community. So, and um, again, I tried to make this presentation relatively general, but my field is music education. So uh, forgive me for having one music specific quotation, but, um, but, but I think this could transfer to most other fields quite frankly. Uh, this is a quotation from Jensen Moulton from 2020. Uh, Only students with economic privilege are the sheer luck to end up at a school and a school zone. I'm not gonna say with a good music program will be prepared to take and pass college level classical auditions. And that's a whole other bone to pick. Um, I would assert, and, and I love classical music. I think it should be part of the curriculum. But the traditional college music curriculum 
is currently inherently racist. It's based on solely a Western European canon exclusively. And unfortunately, it's almost like there's a line drawn in the sand. And we may have students come to us who are very accomplished musicians for their church, for their community, for rock band, whatever. And when they reach that studio, it's like, oh, what you're doing is bad. What you're doing is wrong. And there's like this line in the sand saying, hey, you are great at gospel stride piano. I could learn from you. And now let me help you learn more about Bach or Beethoven. And we've got to reach a point. If we really want to support 21st century learners through culturally relevant pedagogy, we've got to understand that we can learn from them. They can learn from us. And what they're doing already has value. You don't, you, you can't, and in music, and I'm, I don't think this is just strictly in music. I think it's in most fields. There's, I think, still a little bit of this sense of, oh, now you're in college. We're going to teach you the right way to do this instead of we're going to teach you another acceptable way to do this. So more about that later. I'll, I'll try to get off my soapbox. So, can you tell I kind of feel strongly about that? Okay, next, next one, please. Uh, according to the National uh, Education Association, uh, and we hear a lot about 21st century skills. The big idea behind this is really on what are sometimes called soft skills. Because the reality with um, technology is the technology that you learn to use when you're a freshman will probably be obsolete by the time you're a junior or senior. I mean, I, I, I'm a cheap old woman and I have to change my cell phone every now and then because it's obsolete. It, it just won't work with the other stuff. And I, I'd like to keep it for 10 years, but hey, that's not gonna happen. Uh, but uh, so the idea behind this whole notion of 21st century skills is more into what are called soft skills, not specific technologies, but things like critical thinking. I've already mentioned that discriminating between bogus information that you find online and valid information is something that we need to work on our students with to help them be able to discriminate and, and make judgments about you know, what's, oh, is this true? You know, just because it's on Twitter or TikTok or you know, comes up on Google, doesn't mean it's true just because you saw it online. So uh, critical thinking and problem solving. Communication. Our students communicate all the time, but when it comes to making eye contact, face-to-face -face communication, verbal communication, that tends to be something that a lot of them are not comfortable with. And again, it's our job as teachers not to embarrass them or make them feel uncomfortable, but to encourage them and give them opportunities to learn to use multiple modes of com communication. How many times, I've got some wonderful family members here from Tennessee, we're figuring out which restaurant to go out to eat. And I, I, I could, and I, I'm, I, I am not a gambler, I teach statistics. I know the odds, I don't gamble, but uh, I would bet you, and I'm not a gambler, that there will be somebody at that table and the whole family will be doing this as opposed to actually communicating face-to-face -face verbally. So again, it's, and, and it's wonderful to have these things. I'm not saying technology is bad. I'm just saying that we have to learn as teachers to uh, overcome some of the challenges and habits that may be diminishing some of our students' competencies, and at the same time, embrace the good stuff for that. Uh, so according to the National Education Association, 21st century skills, critical thinking and problem solving, communication, collaboration, really being able to collaborate and work well as a team member. And there is uh, well-documented peer-reviewed research that shows that collaborative skills are going down. Uh, I read some really interesting studies from the medical profession. And uh, they were talking about what they deem as professional behaviors, which basically when you read the reports, it has to do with collaboration more than anything. And the medical uh, world is, is quite concerned because current learners are um, dis uh, distributing, um, demonstrating behaviors that are perceived as unprofessional. And it's really lack of communication, 
lack of collaboration, rates of uh, situations where you're having uh, malpractice problems with patients, things like that are occurring in the medical world. I think we see that in the teaching world too. I think in teacher education, uh, and it's not that students are bad, it's just that they're so developing habits and it's our job as teachers to also facilitate communication opportunities to work with other people, collaboration, opportunities to understand how to be a team member, team player, sit around a table with other people and negotiate and discuss and plan. And finally, creativity and innovation. And quite frankly, technology can be a wonderful venue for creativity. But if you rely, case in point, if, if, if you rely on an app to write your term paper for you, then that's not creativity. So, so the challenge is that sometimes the technology makes it so easy. Again, it can be, I'm not anti-technology at all. Technology can be a wonderful tool for creativity, but because it makes it so easy to have things instantly. Uh, I mentioned on NBC News this morning, um, there was a, a special report about that. And, this is a little bit scary, but they were talking about how in some study, they use the new app, the new technology uh, to write a paper for Harvard Law School. And it was evaluated as passing. So, you know, why write a paper when you can click an app in a few seconds? So again, that's, that's the challenge is, is sometimes the technology makes things so easy that you can, uh, you, you lose your own investment, don't have the creativity, maybe don't have quite the motivation for the creativity. So, and, and, and these are things that we need to be aware of as teachers so that we can be sure to engineer situations in our courses to promote these things and to harness the technology as a source for inspiring creativity instead of making it feel unnecessary. Uh, what is culture? If I'm going to talk about culturally responsive or culturally relevant, and when you start reviewing the literature, there are lots of different terms that are very related to this same topic. So, uh, but what is culture? And this is a definition, it's not the only definition, but this is one that I felt was relatively comprehensive and I chose to share with you this afternoon. Uh, language, behavioral expectations, Interpretations of actions and societal expectations are all culturally born and implemented. Culture includes ethnicity and race, as well as gender, class, language, region, religion, exceptionality, and other diversities to help to define individuals. So again, I, I just found this was a fairly, among the many, many definitions out there, I thought this was a fairly comprehensive one. Uh, and again, uh, cult culturally relevant pedagogy. Um, there, there are many terms out there that describe this particular approach to teaching. So sometimes it's culturally re relevant, culturally responsive. This is not new. This is not new. W one of the really cornerstone scholars, writers in this area was Ladson Billings. And in 1995, she crafted this definition uh, pedagogy of opposition, not unlike critical pedagogy, but specifically committed to collective, not merely individual empowerment. Culturally relevant pedagogy rests on three criteria or propositions. One, students must experience academic success. It is our job as teachers to support that. B, two, students must de develop and or maintain cultural competence. And three, students must develop critical consciousness through which they challenge the status quo of the current social order. So, and again, that's from um, several, several years ago, and we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Okay, next one. Uh, here's a more recent conceptual framework um, from Bond. This was the work, uh, Bond based this upon Brown, Jeffy, and Cooper from their 2011 publication, and this was published in 2017. And she identified uh, five different 
aspects of culturally responsive pedagogy. Identity and achievement, equity and excellence, develop, developmental appropriateness, teaching the whole child and student-teacher relationships. And if we talk about identity and achievement, again, it's very important to value what the student brings to the table. Again, in the music world, it's not that the way they sing, they play, they express themselves is bad. It's not that the Western classical Euro European tradition is the way, the truth, and the light, the musical expressivity. You've got to accept what they bring to the table. And then without saying this is bad, this is good, teach them some other ways of expressing themselves, but value what they bring. This is a, some of my students are here. They probably get tired of me doing this, but something I've been doing for the past couple of years is every time I teach a graduate class, uh, I ask everyone to introduce themselves and I ask everyone to um, tell us, and again, in my graduate courses, people are music teachers. So tell us, you know, what you've taught and how many years total have you taught? And the thing that just blows me away is sometimes within one graduate class, we've got 200, 250 years of experience among us. And it's like, wow, do you see how much you have to offer? how much you can bring and contribute to our class. Because you, you don't come here as a tabla rasa. You come into my class with knowledge, with information, with a culture and a background. And I'm not saying that's the best way, but for me, just as an instructor, that's one small thing that I do. To begin the very course, letting students know, I appreciate you, I respect you, I honor what you bring to the table and what you can share with our cohort of scholars. Equity and excellence. Uh, there's still a huge equity gap uh, in terms of music education. Again, that's a whole other, we could spend a couple of hours on that. But if you look at demographics, statistics across the United States, uh, there's a, a, a high significant correlation, surprise, surprise, uh, between the, um, type of school, the socioeconomic level of the parents in that school and the community and access to music programs. Reality is kids in wealthy suburban areas have excellent music programs. Kids in um, lower socioeconomic uh, urban areas, and Dr. King is a, has a lot of good expertise on urban and rural teaching, but uh, kids who teach, uh, who are in rural schools have little to no access to music programs. And if they do have access, it may be substandard. So, I mean, there, there's a huge equity gap. I mean, basically, it's so unfair because basically the rich suburban kids who could afford private lessons if they wanted them and probably do get all the good stuff in school. And the poor kids in the rural country schools and the urban schools and their parents couldn't possibly afford private lessons or after school activities, don't get anything. So that there's, a, there's a huge equity gap in music education in this country. Again, I, I wouldn't be surprised if this doesn't transfer. Teachers in other fields, do, do we see equity gaps in the quality of education in fields other than music? I see nods here, so yeah. Nothing fair about it, nothing fair about it. Uh, so uh, developmental uh, appropriateness. You've got to start where your student is. They don't know what they don't know. You've got to understand where they are, what motivates them, what they need, and you've got to adapt the instruction toward the needs of your students. Uh, teaching the whole child. And I admit sometimes I've, I've sort of fantasized about doing this. You can't just open their noggins and pour the knowledge in. Uh, I mean, there, you have to have a real, don't you wish you could sometimes like, oh, okay, here you go. Um, take this, but um, like I'm, uh, I, I get these little um, probiotic yogurt shots that I drink. Oh, okay, so I've got my gut health going on. Yeah, wouldn't it be nice? We give them, give them a little shot of whatever it is. We're trying to teach them, their body would absorb it, they'll be good to go. You don't just pour knowledge in their noggins. You teach the whole individual, and that means respecting them, 
respecting their race, their background, their family. And again, from a music education perspective, if you criticize a person's musical background, you're insulting their whole family. You're insulting their whole community. You know, it's, oh, that's, you know, that might be okay for your black church, but that's not okay for her concert. You know, it's, it's, it, it's offensive, it's disrespectful, it's racist, quite frankly. So you've got to really understand the whole child, their family, their background, learn from them, learn with them and support that. And student-teacher relationship. Like I say, they're, you're not just trying to pour knowledge into their heads. You wanna have a relationship. You wanna to get to know them. You want them to know you as a human being, someone who respects them. And at that point, if you get that respect going, and I've warned students, it's like, I really like you and I'm gonna push you hard. So I, I mean, really respecting a student means pushing them hard. One interesting finding, a little bit of a side, because I didn't want to talk too much about my own research today, aside from this lit review, but one, okay, I'm checking my time. I think I'm okay. Libby, you're going to let me know if I go too far. I'm good. Oh, I'm good. So um, one thing that I found that's really perhaps not that surprising, but in interviewing um, my first generation music graduates, uh, talking with people of color who attended an HBCU had a much more nurturing, supporting experience compared to people of color who attended a larger public university. And one thing in particular that's standing out is those students talk about how hard the faculty were on them. It's not like, oh, they were easy on me because we're all black. No, it's like, wow, she kicked my butt. This person really, really pushed me to do my best. And that happened because there was mutual respect and a cultural appreciation that was understood between the student and the faculty. So again, just one of them, and I don't want to talk too much about my own research, but just one really interesting finding is to look at the difference in the experience from a person of color attending an HBCU and a person of color attending a larger public university where there were comments like, I never quite felt like I belonged, othering, um, kind of getting lost in the crowd, in some cases, even feeling like faculty were too easy on them because they assumed that they couldn't perform at a higher level. So yeah, student-teacher relationships, things to think about. Okay. And um, pedagogy literally means what? Pedagogy, teaching, Children, right? Whereas andragogy means teaching grownups, right? So, uh, as college teachers, uh, really we're talking about andragogy because we're teaching adults. So, um, Bond and Russell formed this um, theory, they called it culturally responsive pedagogical andragogical content knowledge. CR pack. And this represents the intersection of Lanson, Lanson Billings theory of culturally relevant education, uh, I'm sorry, cult culturally responsive education with Hodson's pedagogical content knowledge. And uh, this figure was taken from Bond and Russell's 2021 article. And it just shows uh, the intersection of culturally responsive education and pedagogical, andragogical content knowledge, which they're calling that theoretical model CRPECT. Just, just the whole idea of being very sensitive to all these needs for your learners. <clears throat> so what is culturally responsive teaching? And it's a lot of things manifested in a lot of different ways. Uh, it's providing opportunities for all students but not just, not just students. One of the things about culturally responsive teaching is, okay, the teachers have to learn as well. Uh, as a middle-class Southern middle-aged white woman, I have to learn more about other cultures and have very, very difficult reflective conversations with colleagues and conversations with myself. Culturally responsive teaching means that the teacher has to change too. 
not just the students. So uh, opportunities for all students and teachers to learn about and legitimize the cultural heritage of themselves and others. And it's not just you, like I say, dispensing information to the students. It's, it's two way. You're learning from the students, they're learning from you and you're coming to gain more understanding of one another. Culturally responsive teaching involves understanding students' identities, achievements, and perspectives. I'll never know what it feels like to be a 13-year-old black girl in middle school, but I can try to understand what she's experiencing. I can listen to her describe what she's experiencing and rather just assuming that all the students are gonna be alike, I can, I can begin to understand this is where you're coming from. This is where you're coming from and begin to respect that and appreciate that. Teaching from a more student-driven rather than curriculum-driven perspective. The, and people here in my classes have heard me say this before. It's, it's like, okay, we're not in service to our syllabus. Our syllabus is in service to you. And if I decide that we need to take more time on something, if I decide that we need to change directions a little bit, we're gonna do it. Because the whole point of this experience is to help you develop as a scholar in this field, not to just adhere mindlessly. And I'm not saying a syllabus isn't important if you don't wanna have a plan, but I'm just saying that the students are more important. Our students are more important they're what matter, not the syllabus, not the content. I'm not, I'm not dismissing those things. I'm saying the students are what matter. That's why we teach. That's what we're here for. Um, and then actively supporting and enabling equity in the classroom, school, and community. Not just lip service, not looking the other way, but taking risks and speaking up. If something's wrong, it's wrong. So again, really becoming an, ab an advocate and an enabler, not just in your own classroom, but as part of your own practice as a human being. Providing a safe space for thoughtful discussion. Uh, and I think lots of times for music teachers, lots of times the choral room the band room, the orchestra hall is a safe space. Uh, you know, typically that's where the kids hang out. But do kids feel safe in your classroom? Are people comfortable really expressing what they think or are they afraid to talk? So that's that, and that, that takes time to develop, but, but your classroom should be a safe space. And this is probably the hardest part. You've got to change. As a teacher, you've got to make actively work on change as a teacher, changing what you do and how you think. That, that's, not, that's not easy, guys. That's not easy. So uh, I'd like to have a little bit of time just to, um, I would love to hear from you. We've got some wonderful master teachers in this audience. I would love to hear from you and some of your suggestions for how to really be effective in bringing about culturally responsive teaching. I'd, I'd love for some people to share out a little bit and have a little discussion as we go. Yes, sir. Okay. Right. I was thinking research and teaching, but my thoughts on teaching, because I'm interested in pedagogy, not just to be an instructor, but to try to do as best as I can with it. So I'm right. looking for advice on next steps, because right now I'm taking a course on course development. Right. So I'm looking for advice for a future college educator. Wow. Um... I don't pretend to be the sage on the stage. I guess I am the sage on the stage right now. But, but um, anyway, but uh, 
I've, I, I found that over the many years I've taught, learning to listen more, really hear my students, respect them, learn who they are and what they are, and, and really learn to respect and appreciate your wonderful students it is huge. Listen more and really pay attention to how the students respond to what you're doing when you're teaching. Again, it's, it's not... I'm not saying delivery of content isn't important. It is, but it's not just about, again, like, like my um, comments about technology. Hey, if you want to learn content, you can go online. Oh, and I, I love TED Talks, by the way. But if you, if you want to learn content, you can get the content. So what is it about what you're going to do as a teacher, value added, that makes a student want to come to your class and listen to you and talk with you as opposed to just logging on and learning material from a, from a, from a YouTube video or a TED talk. Think about that. We've got a lot of good educators. So help, anybody else wanna give him some suggestions for just beginning to develop his teaching skills? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. What can they get from interacting with you if they can't get online? So why? Very good question, Bobby. And thank you for wanting to become a teacher. And uh, the uh, believe it or not, the engineering and music go pretty well together. Don't they? Like okay. Yes. Very good. So you challenge again, like I say, I, I I learn as much or more from my students as they probably learned from me. It sounds like you challenged him and pushed him to become a better teacher too. So. Well, we won't go there. We won't go there. Thank you. Other other questions or comments just here. Somebody else. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Wow. <laughs> Talking with colleagues whom I trust. Uh, this is personal, but but uh, prayerfulness. Uh, for me personally, that's that's a really good process for me. Prayerfulness, meditation, reading a lot. I'm a nerd. I love to. Uh, I, I was refreshing my lit review. And prepare, I was up to like two o'clock because I started getting into the library. And it's, oh my gosh, I've got to read that. And I've got to read. Oh, and this is from medicine. So I, I love to read, love to learn, learn, to learn new ideas. But yeah, the, but the personal part, I'm not good at that. It's hard. It's hard. I mean, we get set in our ways and you know, we think what we know is right and good and just. And when you start really expanding your thinking, well, maybe it's not so right. And, I guess I wish I could tell you a magic answer for that, but for me, it's, it's quite a struggle. But I find if I can be in safe situations and bounce things off colleagues that I trust, especially colleagues who are from a different culture, different generation, different ethnicity, and if we have enough trust and safety that we can have those hard conversations. Uh, and I admit, you know, as a middle-class white woman, I, I don't want to offend somebody. I care, and sometimes I'm afraid to ask a question because I'm afraid that the question will be offensive because I care. But yet, if you don't have the safety to ask that question, you may be operating, you know, a little bit askew. So I think for me, it comes down to prayerfulness and personal reflection, just reading a lot. I just love to look at what's coming out there and new information. And if you can find some colleagues across all different um, areas of diversity, and you can really have those very, very hard, safe conversations. I think that's, and I'm not there yet, I admit it, but, but for me, I think that's helping me get along the way. I don't know, but what, what, what do you recommend? What do you do? To... <laughs> of course, I'm a teacher, that's what I do. That's exactly what I do. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Right. 
Right. So I, I tend to say my self reflection ask myself, you know, how does how does my privileges as a um, black man and hopefully one day have some things people want to know about? <laughs> oh, it's coming. <laughs> have faith, it's coming. So no, um, very good. Um, yeah. Today, yeah. Yeah. And, and again, that reflection and having the courage to ask those critical questions. Very good. Uh, anybody else? Will we have a few more minutes? Okay. Anybody else? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes. Oh. Thank you for thank you for picking up on that. Uh, yeah, they 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 absolutely do. Thank you. Okay, uh, okay, so here we go. So thank you and war ego. Thank you all so much. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's the up there? Oh, okay. <laughs> So I think you can all see why Dr. Berry is so well respected among her colleagues and students. As the graduate school's partner and co-sponsor of this event, I want to welcome Steve Ibanet, who is the Alumni Scholarship Coordinator with Auburn Advancement for our awards presentation. Uh, thank you. On behalf of the Auburn Alumni Association, we want to award Dr. Nancy Berry for her scholarly contributions to the graduate education at Auburn University. We present this check of $2,000 as an honorarium. Dr. Berry. So in addition, we present another certificate signed by President Roberts to honor Dr. Berry as the Distinguished Graduate Faculty Lecturer at Auburn University. It says, in recognition of outstanding dedication and contributions to graduate education at Auburn University, Dr. Nancy Berry is hereby named the Distinguished Graduate Faculty Lecturer for 2022 to 2000. 23, signed by Chris Roberts, president. Let's get all of us. Mm Yeah, thank you for attending today's lecture and for your support of this program and for Dr. Berry. We now invite you to join us next door in the Grand Hall number three for reception. Thank you and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.